for coming back. I have, I have tied you up in knots and forced you to come, and I appreciate you giving up your time in the office and being here to teach the audience what I believe they need to know. Cutting edge medicine, 21st century medicine, uh, you're even using different stethoscopes than we've used in the last 40 years. So I believe that, that what you're doing in your office needs to be known, needs to be seen, and you need to talk. <laughs> so what I'd like, is, the first thing that you showed me when you hired me and I walked into your office was this brain mapping, okay. which blew me away, and I went, what? Take it from there. Will do. My privilege. Thank you for having me. This, this is a story about how we evolved from not doing any brain evaluations into having mapped probably more patients than any other office in the country. And why we do that is because it helps so many families. Not just one person, but it helps families. So what you're going to hear is a story as to how you can identify dyslexics in children before they even go to school and we can identify propensity to dementias as we sunset in our lives. This all began and the US Army and not my service, uh, mine was uneventful compared to this. This was when the men and women came home from Afghanistan and those men and women had significant PTSD and with the help of major facilities, USC and others, we were part of a, 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 what they call the Wounded Warrior Program. And they, DARPA was, if you look at DARP, the Defense Agency of the United States Army, these people did a fantastic job. They created a mapping. Initially, it was a wet map, which means they put a cap on your head and put a bunch of gel in it so they'd have good connectivity. And then they would map it, and that would help us know the status of anxiety, stress, depression in the men and women that came home. So we were a part of that for a few couple of years. And then after that, we got into uh, helping those that had had brain trauma. And the TBIs, the traumatic brain injuries, could be identified. And so could the people who had had brain tumors. So I, we, we had a loved one, a daughter that had uh, a couple of brain tumors that brought me, brought me into the world of brain mapping and how to track therapies that are intracranial, inside your brain. How do you determine if somebody's getting better or worse? And so we began uh, an entire uh, program that's now in an entire building. It's called the Brain Computer Interface and we map as part of the physical exam for every patient that comes in a brain map that measures the five brain waves. Those five brain waves are with us from birth. And <clears throat> what we have is a certain uh, wave. So all waves are two things. Their frequency, how fast they go, boom, 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 and how large amplitude, frequency and amplitude. And you go ahead. I think we have a, a slide on that where we can put it up and you can exp people can see it. There it is. Oh, and all right. you could explain I got a uh, All right. So the brain waves are of five types. The delta is the slow one and that relates to sleep. And so we can tell if you're having good sleep or when you're sleeping. Then you get theta as part of sleep or part of dreaming, as it states there, is easy to determine when you're there as well. When you're conscious, you're awake, and that's an alpha wave, and it's usually very methodical. That reflects relaxation. The beta is when you're contemplating and thinking, and the high beta is when you're intensely thinking and you're trying to solve problems. And so we, we can take the five waves, and we can tell you which are out of balance in the way you are. And so you can easily get these back into balance with training. This is just like a muscle. Instead of training your bicep, you train your mind. In fact, we have an entire department of our practice 
is called kinesiology, and many people are aware that that discipline are men and women that are experts on muscle movement. And we're more interested in function than strength. Physical therapy, God knows we need those, and they are very good for helping us get stronger. But when you're where I am in life, you're not too worried about getting stronger. You just want everything to work. And so it function become more important than strength. That requires our ability to not only train the muscle, we have to train the mind. So we use muscle training begins here in the motor cortex. No muscle moves without the motor cortex. So we focus on the mind. We train the mind to train the muscle. And we get better movements and more function if we get the mind in a balance. That's also true of learning. So we mentioned very briefly the importance of identifying dyslexia. I cannot tell you how many patients over 50, over 40, and they come through the office and we see the pattern of dyslexia and it helps them. In fact, we had one man who owned a business. He had every patient go through the brain mapping simply because he wanted to identify who were dyslexic because it improved their productivity of his business. In other words, it made him more money if he could fix those patients and it's a minimal time. I mean, it's within two months you change the way you think the rest of your life. That's quite an investment. All right. Well, one of the things that I know that uh, a lot of people are wondering, uh, they've had a grandparent or a mother or a father who had dementia or Alzheimer's and they were put in a home and now they're starting to age and they're saying, is that going to be me? Or has medicine evolved where it's not going to happen to mm -hmm. us? I would guess that most people realize it, but we'll just articulate it. And that is the, probably one of the major frontiers of medicine is the mind. There, there's more exciting and, and, and very beneficial things happening in the mind than most other areas of medicine. So what we, what we focused on, again, is outcomes. How do you get people so they can think better? There's a lot of regenerative therapies that are done in other countries, as well as in America, that optimize uh, thinking and decrease dementia. So dementia has a lot of ugly uh, facets to it and you're, you're sort of lost in yourself and it starts with memory and most people have appreciation that it could be genetic so if your grandpa had it maybe you could have it I had a man in the office yesterday that said he knew his grandpa and his father and now he's sitting in a situation that he feels he's on that similar road so we did a map on him, and in fact, he was right. He's a police officer, and so he's very sensitive to small changes in the way he reacts and the way he thinks. And he did a great job, very wise man. And so we'll help him mitigate the rapidity of that process. In other words, how fast you age, that's really what we're talking about, okay. is aging of the mind. And so we can help that. Can you reverse it? Sometimes, but it depends upon the cause. But you could slow it down. For sure you can slow it down, but you got to decide if that's an investment you want to make as far as the time and energy, and rarely, but sometimes even money, time, energy, to pay attention to how you think. All right, what about stroke patients? Wow. We have a lot of stroke patients that were have had miraculous success. Mm -hmm. we, our stroke pro program is probably one of our, uh, I guess, uh, most prideful areas because we're able to do so much good for those patients. Most strokes happen on one side, not two. Most pro strokes are due to a lack of blood, ischemia, not due to a hemorrhage, not too much blood. In every case, regardless of what side it's on, if it's on the left side, it's the right arm and the right leg that's affected. If it's on the opposite, the uh, vice versa. 
So what you have to realize is on the left side is where the brain thinks. So, and speech is here. Speech is in Broca's area in Wernicke's. So if you have a stroke on the left side, means your right arm and your right leg are a little weak and, and hemiplegic, then you're also gonna have speech affected. Now that's not true of all speech, but it's true of most. It's fascinating to learn that music is on the other side. Music is on the right side. So you'd have to have a right-sided stroke to affect your ability to sing and to play your instruments. We've been able to learn from many people. We, we're based in Orange County, and so there's many people who work for Disneyland and other areas, not that uh, perform, and they come to our office, and we're able to help them with they, uh, whatever their, their deficit is in terms of their stroke. But again, we don't just train the muscle, we train the mind. So it's the motor cortex that helps that. And when you're looking at uh, something as important as a stroke, that's, that's a rehab. So it involves many different stages. We've had to develop our own and we use mapping to show the progress and we include the family. So the wife or husband or significant other come with them and participate. It, it's fantastic because it takes a tremendous load off their burden if they could simply use the restroom themselves or make their own breakfast. Or, and, well, and speak. You had a patient when I first started the first day who could, couldn't, I don't even think he could say one word. Now, two months later, he's in his speaking sentences. Yeah, that's David. Yes, yeah. you're right. All right, now, ADHD. Whoa. Oh, yeah. Well, like dyslexia, the ADHD kids, and uh, those aren't just kids. Some of them are adults. Oh, adults. Yeah, you can pick up that as a pattern. So maybe it's appropriate to take a minute and say, brain waves are patterns. So you got five waves floating through there, and some are high and some are low, and some are fast and some are slow. So if you take time to look at the pattern, you can identify the disorder. So we can pick those up and we can help them. What about depression? Wow. Can you pick that up on a brainwave? Depression is really part of a trilogy. You start with stress, end up, end up with anxiety, and then you get enough of it and you get depression. There's many types of depression. In fact, there are entire books on it. The DSM-6 now and all the different diagnostic classifications of mental disorders is plaguing our country. You don't have to go down to Los Angeles to see the, the, the plight of the, of the homeless and all the mentally ill patients. And uh, must, by far and away, the majority have some facet of concurrent mental illness with depression, anxiety, or stress. Yeah. And, but can that be picked up on the brain waves? The answer is yes, you can pick it up on brain waves and you, because it correlates with the other questionnaires and testing we do. It's not one thing. Okay. You can't just say, oh, this is like listening to your heart and you hear a murmur. You gotta say, okay, what's the murmur, what valve, what's the cause of it? It's pretty technical. Same thing with the brain. What about insomnia? <laughs> but I re there was a book that was written uh, a little while ago, maybe 10 years ago, about, uh, you know, America uh, is not sleeping or something like that. It was a, a popular I think, book. I think that's fair. And most of us who've trained in hospitals know insomnia like the back of our hand. In fact, we know the medications and the order in which they can be given so you can get to sleep. That's because when you're on call at night in a hospital, you really you focus on three types of medicines, painters, poopers, and sleepers. You have painters and poopers and sleepers, and you know them by heart by the time you're done with your training. And what our job is on the insomnia side is to say, is it trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or waking up refreshed? And whatever the trouble is, we've got to take the time to identify the cause if you're having terrors or you're having nightmares or something, then we have to treat it completely different than if it's fatigue or stress. So you talked about this terrors, this night, night terrors. terrors. Yeah. What, what is that? And do people have it at home and then they kind of keep it quiet? You know, they don't say to the doctor, doctor, when I'm at night, I'm, I have night terrors. 
Night terrors are significant, they're harsh, and they're brutal because you'll wake up in just a fit of, uh, uh, you're unsettled, you're disoriented, and you're scared to death. And so what happens is your brain's on a different wavelength than, literally, <laughs> than, than what you're used to. And, and if they live alone, oh. nobody knows that they're going through that. And that's even true if they're not alone, because if they're in separate bedrooms or whatever's going on, let's say that one's a child and one's an adult or one's an adult and one's a grandparent, you definitely have all kinds. And then what they try to do often is mask it with some booze or some pills or something that's not good for them. It's far, far better to identify the cause and to treat them. All right. And uh, I want to talk about your brain rehab um, mm -hmm. program okay. that you have. You have, um, you want to tell us about sure. the, after the brain mapping, you yeah, go into brain the, training. Sure. After the map, the map is determining where the five brain waves line and where they're out of whack and how do we fix it. Most of the time, you can fix it without drugs. That's the beauty of this. This is like riding a bike. Once you get back on the bike, all you have to do is get back in shape and... and, uh, and you remember. And, and, and that's right, and you remember. So that brings us into what, uh, what are the most current theories in terms of how we can help people remember. And that goes right into the dementia as well as the, uh, uh, the, the training takes you into various types of rehab. So the rehab includes, in addition to the training, the brain training, and that has multiple modalities, but it takes you into intravenous therapies that give you back the chemicals required for brain transmission, and it takes you into peptides usually. The peptides are proteins. They're built on two or more, and they're normally in your body, and you can deplete them pretty easily. And so you can give peptides back. They're, they're commissioned and that you can purchase them. You have to be very careful how they're used. All, all of our programs, including the brain, is mo are monitored by not only physicians, but pharmacists as well. We have teams helping people. Okay, now you have something called a mind wellness program. What is that? <laughs> Well, I think it's fair to say that all of us can think better. I, I think most people, if you put them in a room, who could think better? We, oh, we'd all raise our hands. Oh, I can think better. Mm -hmm. We'd wish we could think yeah. better, right? Yeah. And in fact, most of us realize that as we age, <laughs> we've lost more than we wish we had. So the mindfulness program has to do with learning how to control it so it doesn't control you. The meditation and other things. I was certified in hypnosis with a friend in Arizona as well as my daughter. And one of the things we learned is the importance of meditation and mindfulness. Mindfulness, in other words, instead of getting uh, in, into a, uh, I, I guess I'd, I'd say almost a whirlpool of just worrying more and more and more and more. Wait a minute, slow down here. Let's reconnoiter. Let's, let's take an assessment for where we are and how we can improve, not only ourselves, but others. Many times, this is rooted in stress. Well, we cannot go any further than the stress of long COVID. I want you to go back okay. to 2020 and talk about what you, I know what I did, because I was a COVID doctor and had 20 patients a day, some of them dying. I had three a week dying, and it was shocking. You know, they would be there, and then you'd hear that they died in the hospital. I'd send them to the ER, and then maybe a relative would come back and say, you saw my uncle, and I want you to know he passed away. And this was, this was happening fast in the early of 2020s. What did you do in your office for the COVID patients, and what do you do now? Two big questions. I think we all need to, especially those of us that are providers, need to reflect on this experience. We've learned a lot. We know what not to do as well as what to do. Mm -hmm. Here is a serious infection, and here is a 
turmoil in our country. It, many decisions were made that were not rooted in science. Many decisions were made that were not tracked correctly. I can remember, and even today, many of my peers would say, we, we don't have the accuracy of, of any testing that we're proud of. There's over a 5-0, 50% inaccuracy of false negatives and false positives. Most patients would say, and my peers would say, what are the treatments? Because there's no standard treatment in this country. There's no staging of this illness, and nobody can tell us what's the best thing to do for which patient. So that brings us to the third part, and that is the protection. The protection is like, we, we in, in, in California, you can go from county to county and have different rules. You can drive over a border of a county and have to wear a mask or wear whatever it is. I mean, we can get into arguments about it, but there's no standardization. It is a, just a dismal failure of our nation. So what did we do? We looked at the patients individually and we said, where are you? What are your symptoms? How do we get the symptoms better? We improved their immune system categorically across the board. And we kept them healthy as we could for their brain, the brain first, then the heart and the lungs, and then the myriad of things going on across their tummy. And that included their immune system. We had to boost their immune system. And we watched a lot of death and dying as well, and it still bothers me today how many of these people. Yeah. So I think what we need to do from COVID is not cry over spilled milk. Gosh knows we can't put milk back in the bottle. But what we can do is we can learn from it. And I don't know who is going to lead that, but the majority of institutions in our country have lost a lot of credibility because of what's happened with COVID. So we have a concerted effort and continue to do our best on an individual basis. But what did, in the beginning, when we didn't know anything, were you all gowned and draped in plastic and, and made them stay in the car? That's what we did. We made them we had, stay in the car. We wouldn't even let them come into the that's office. That's a good question. But what we did was very akin to that. We had what they called a restrictive practice. Mm -hmm. If you had any symptoms, then you had to have a test. If the test was negative, you could come in. Was that easy? If not, then you were restricted. You were restricted, uh, but we had protocols so we could help them because of the blessing of the pharmacists and other things that worked with us. We could give them injections right in, the, in their cars and we could help them and many families. This ran in families. It was you were there. It was like rampant. Some yeah. families would have five people yeah. or seven positive. Yeah. Some people would be in a bed. Yeah and they couldn't come in, yeah. and then it got a little dicey. Yeah. So what we did is we did the best we could. So your protocol in the beginning, what made you, like with me, what I did, and I, I don't know if I, I did it before anybody else, around, okay, March and April, the patients were very sick. They, I, I asked them and they told me the same story. First, I got the worst headache I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. Then I spiked to 103 temperature. Then I got a sore throat. Then I got a cough. Then I had shortness of breath. And the next thing they said was, my legs got so weak, I couldn't walk from my bed to the bathroom. That was the story on everybody in March and April and May of 2020. By June, we started hearing, I've lost my smell and taste. And then I would say, well, well, what do you mean? And they'd say, well, when I'd eat something, it was like sand. Or if I drank a Coke, it was like drinking oil, a gasoline. And of course, they couldn't smell anything. And then by September of October of 2020, they were testing positive with no symptoms. So now I know what my theory is. What is your theory? Remember, vaccines hadn't come out. How did we go from 103 temperature in March with I can't breathe, shortness of breath and dying to October, nothing but a sniffle or even a no symptoms? Well, I think you need a compliment, Helen, because you're able to review and remember things that are just a blur to me. We were just inundated. We have people coming out our ears and illness everywhere. 
And we were doing our best to stay healthy enough to help them. Uh. So I think you need a compliment. In fact, you should write that down because what was happening is we had a mixture of all of those symptoms and we didn't have clean cut dates like that. We were a, a metropolitan urban practice and we had all these ethnicities and all kinds of variations in age. So we had a, we did not have as clear cut borders as you. But I remember when I got to your office, you had your your uh, pharmacists and everyone going to the car That's to right. give them a protocol. That's right. What was that protocol? The protocol had to do with four major things, and one of them had to, and they were in part, if not all, all were researched and re referenced because that's how we work. But in, in one instance, there was an immune booster. In one instance, there was uh, a pro, uh, peptide, an immune booster, a peptide. Then we had dexamethasone we used for the pulmonary, if they had pulmonary, because that was a steroid that helped tremendously. Yeah. And then we had something for, for energy as well. Okay. And those were the four injections. They received them in the muscle, and they, we had tremendous benefit from it. All right. So now, for the last minute or so that we have, <laughs> I want you to speak to your new patients that have fallen in love with you, want you as their physician, can see that you're a highly trained medical doctor with, with a... You've got, you've got such a wide area of no, wisdom and knowledge and understanding of medicine, and they want to come to you. They want you to be their doctor. How do they do that? You're taking new patients. What's the best way besides a phone call? And, and I, I think in, from my perspective, it, it's almost the reverse. It's a privilege to have new patients. Uh -huh. And I think the other thing is it's a... It's a it's a fundamental uh, importance to any physician to do optimal care, to take the best care of people you can. And that begins with education. So I think one of the goals we should have is to make sure we're on the same page as we bring you on board and, and realize the similar expectations, measure it, and do our best. Well, you've met Dr. Bryn Henderson. And I hope that you've enjoyed our series, if you've watched our series of shows that we've done with him, and that you can see that, like I saw, it's not like any other medicine or any other physician you will ever go to. And I thank you for being with me. I thank you for being with us. And 